I, my idea was that I would introduce the campaign for a UN Parliamentary Assembly, um, speak a little bit about the proposal and the state of affairs, and then maybe um, you can start a discussion with your other speakers. Um, the campaign for UN Parliamentary Assembly was introduced already by Ms. Basi, I think, but um, it was launched in 2007, eight years ago. And uh, by now it is supported by 1,400 members of parliament, current and former members of parliament uh, from around 100 countries, and the campaign has supporters in 150 countries. Um, Argentinians have played an important role in the campaign, and uh, we can be very happy to have Fernando Iglesias, among the speakers today, who was instrumental in organizing the support of the Latin American Parliament and the Parliament of Mercosur a few years ago um, of the proposal of the UN Parliamentary Assembly. And I think it was mentioned that the fourth international meeting on the UN Parliamentary Assembly was held in the Senate of Argentina, co-hosted by the organization Democracia Global. Um, that was a very good and important meeting for the campaign a few years ago also. So Argentina has played an important role so far, and I hope this tradition will be continued. Um, Fernando was also, uh, that was mentioned, the co-chair of the parliamentary advisory group of the campaign when he was still an Argentinian member of parliament, and uh, he was um, succeeded by Gabriela Michetti, who is also an Argentinian. Uh, she is now together with Jolain Mukherjee, co-chair of the campaign. Well, the goal of the campaign is to achieve um, a majority of government support for the establishment of a parliamentary assembly at the UN. So we will require, sooner or later, um, we have to convince a majority of governments at the UN to endorse this proposal. And the idea is strategically to um, convince them by first getting parliaments and parliamentarians on board. That's why parliamentarians are an important um, pillar of the campaign, but also non-government organizations play an important role like Democracia Global in Argentina and others throughout the world. And other important pillar are academics um, are also involved. More recently, I would like to mention that the uh, Commission on World Security, Justice and Governance, co-chaired by um, former U.S. Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, and the former Foreign Minister of Nigeria, Ibrahim Gambari, and contained around 80 recommendations. And one uh, important recommendation that they included was the establishment of a U.N. parliamentary network. Um, this network, they envisage, would be a first step towards a fully-fledged uh, parliamentary assembly at the end. And you are certainly aware that this, is, this year is the 70th anniversary of the United Nations, and that's why recommendations like that of the Commission of uh, you know, Security, Justice and Governance might get more attention than usually such recommendations will get. The, it is uh, interesting to note that other than commissions in the past, like the Commission on Global Governance that issued a report back 20 years ago, um, the Commission now on uh, Global Security, Justice and Governance not only issued, issues a report, and then they, you know, the thing is done, uh, it's different because this time the Commission also wants to follow up on its own recommendations, and the idea is that the Commission, together with partners throughout the world, will try to push for a world view and world conference on the reform of global institutions in 2020. So also for the campaign for UN Parliamentary Assembly, the next five years have a strategic importance because we um, wish to work together with the Commission and uh, global partners to achieve the establishment of the UN Parliamentary Network make an assembly until 2020 uh, at this conference. But um, 
more importantly, what is the UN Parliamentary Assembly about? I think that's a question that you will address today at this event. And I have a few thoughts instead of the matter. The UN Parliamentary Assembly is about giving the world citizens and humanity a voice in all the global affairs that affect them. You need to be aware that today the UN and global institutions are bodies that are member state based, meaning that those who are represented there are the executive branches of governments. We as the world citizens or humanity as a whole, we are not represented in global institutions today. The UN General Assembly that is normally looked at as the most representative and even the most democratic body in the world is a body that is composed of member states and diplomats. So the idea is that a parliamentary assembly would complement today's structure with elected representatives. At the beginning, we think that for pragmatic reasons, the assembly could be composed of national parliamentarians, maybe regional parliamentarians. Directly elected by all of the world citizens. That seems to be a problem. Okay, is the connection back? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So the idea is that eventually um, the parliamentary assembly would be directly elected by the world citizens and initially could be composed of national parliamentarians. So it is not only about giving the world citizens voice, but also to address the democratic deficit that exists in, in global affairs. This deficit has many sources, and I would like to give you a few figures uh, just to, to illustrate this. Um, as I mentioned already, the UN General Assembly is looked at as the most representative body in the world. Because, uh, why is that? Because all states are equally represented. But the problem is that the principle of one state, one vote, that you would find implemented in all global institutions, collides with the principle, democratic principle of one person, one vote. So if you look at the General Assembly, you will discover the theory the 128 populous countries in the world are able to take third majority decisions, although they only represent 8.4% of the world's population. And if it was, if you look at it in theory, the 65 least populous countries are able to block the two-third majority vote, although they represent less than 1% of the world's population. The 10 most populous countries in the world together represent almost 60% of the world's population but they only have 10 of 193 votes in the general assembly. So this is a major democratic deficit, that the people as such are not represented. It's the governments. Bottom line is that the first powers are represented in the same way that 1.3 billion Chinese. So the idea is that a parliamentary assembly at the UN would um, take population size into account in the distribution of seats. So we would try to um, head towards a system of one person, one vote, which is of course a vision and there are also intermediary steps necessary. The idea is to implement a system like we, for example, have the European Parliament, which is called digressive proportionality, meaning that smaller countries would get um, more um, members of parliament uh, per capita in large countries. The good thing is that um, a parliamentary assembly could be established without charter reform in the first step. You know that a reform of UN charter is extremely difficult because it requires not only two-thirds ratification by all member states but also approval of all five permanent members of the Security Council. So in the long run, Although we would um, try to have a UN Parliamentary Assembly transformed into a main body 
of the UN, and the first step it could be established by a simple vote of the General Assembly according to Article 22 of the UN's Charter. This is a, practically, this is a very important aspect because um, establishing a parliamentary assembly at the UN is easier legally than adding just one single seat to the Security Council. This is something we need to be aware of. Um, so, what would the UN Parliamentary Assembly do? We believe its functions would include at the beginning largely consultative matters, mainly it could shadow the commissions of the UN General Assembly, it could establish a commission structure that shadows the um, system of the UN, the different institutions, and uh, thus would be able to exercise oversight and to um, include the voice of opposition parties into the deliberations at the UN, because this is another source of the democratic deficit, and I indicated it already, that it's only the executive branches of governments that are represented, so opposition parties and minorities don't have an international voice, and that's something the parliamentary assembly is supposed to change. The members of the assembly would not be subject to the authority of governments, that's an important point. And one of the main aspects, and something that might come up in your discussions later is, um, and that's often raised, that today there are still countries that are not democratic. So parliamentarians coming from those countries would, in fact, be subject to the authority of their uh, government. But um, the thing is that in the first step, while the assembly still has consultative functions only, we believe that all UN member states need to be included never, nonetheless, because today 125 countries are considered electoral democracies, and if we look at the models for the distribution of seats, we discover that uh, that majority, whatever um, reasonable model we take, a majority of the members of parliament will come from democratic countries. And what's more is that we believe even that in uh, you know, even if autocratic countries are included, we would support opposition forces coming from these countries. So, um, in fact, we look at the UN Parliamentary Assembly also as an actor, as an, um, an agent for change and an agent for democratization at the national level as well. So, oversight is one of the functions the Parliamentary Assembly would have to take on, but also we believe one of the main, main um, things that the Parliamentary Assembly would have to do is to address the reform of institutions and to be an agent of change and the transformation of the system so that we would head towards the creation of a world parliament that com in, in conjunction with the General Assembly as the representation of states would be able to um, adopt binding world law as a uh, you know, under certain circumstances and under strict limitations. But uh, that's the direction that it needs to take. And to close um, this introduction, let's look at it from a very broad historic perspective. If we look at the um, development of governance and democracy in human history, we can identify three big transformations. The first transformation was when the first kind of democratic governance um, was established 500 before Christ in Greek city-states. That was, you know, the, the uh, assembly democracy of eligible men who came together on uh, town squares and voted and took decisions. And for 2,000 years, democracy was identified with this small direct democracy form. But what happened was, in the course of the French and the American revolutions in the 18th century, the principle of representative democracy was invented, and democracy was expanded to the large territorial state. That was the second democratic transformation in um, human history. And what we are witnessing today as um, global matters, um, as well, let's put it in a different way, as there has developed one single world society and as global interdependence has grown so strong. So what we are witnessing today is a third transformation, not only of governance, 
because we need global governance more than ever before, but also of democracy, because what we now see is the expansion of democracy to the planetary scale. Um, that's a necessity of this century. And uh, I think that uh, UN Parliamentary Assembly, as a first step towards the world parliament, is an indispensable milestone in, in this um, third transformation. Um, thank you very much. I hope that you will have a great event and very good discussions. Actually, I'm sure that you will have that since you have two very excellent speakers following my humble remarks. Thank you.